Day 171 of the war in Gaza, fighting continues in and around Shifa Hospital in Gaza City and fighting renewed in Khan Yunus. But there is no sign of an Israeli operation in the densely populated Rafa area. Rafa is where Israeli leaders have repeatedly stressed that four Hamas brigades remain intact in the city and insist that victory cannot be complete without eliminating the remaining organized terrorist forces and leadership believed hiding in underground tunnels. Rafah is a safe haven for some 1.3 million Gazan civilians. Many were instructed to move there by the IDF when operating in northern Gaza. The IDF has presented a plan of action that would move the civilians before the offensive is launched, but the government, facing U.S. and world pressure, has yet to give the order. Defense Minister Gallant arrived in Washington today for talks focused on the conduct of a potential Rafah operation and a plan for post-war Gaza. Meanwhile, the operation at Shifa Hospital is ongoing. The fighters of the 401st Brigade's combat team raided buildings there as part of the operation. During the fighting, the forces located many weapons and arrested and eliminated terrorists. During the operation, fighters searched a four-story building after shots were fired. When they reached the fourth floor, the forces encountered a terrorist who threw grenades. They eliminated him and continued to search the building. This operation isn't over yet. Right now, Hamas and Islamic Jihad terrorists are barricading themselves inside the Shifa hospital wards. Hamas is destroying the Shifa hospital. Hamas is firing from inside the Shifa emergency room and maternity ward and throwing explosives devices from the Shifa burn ward. Terrorists hiding around the hospital are firing mortars at our forces, causing extensive damage to the hospital buildings. In Khan Yunis, IDF fighters from the 98th Division again raided the Al Amal neighborhood to continue dismantling terrorist infrastructure and eliminate terrorists in the area. The operation began with the Air Force destroying about 40 terrorist targets. Among the targets attacked were military buildings, underground tunnels, and other terrorist infrastructure. The Army issued a warning calling on Hamas terrorists to stop using hospitals and other civilian facilities as a shield for their terror activities, which harm innocent civilians. They deny the kidnapping of our children, the murder of our grandchildren, the rape of our daughters. The new Nazis we face today will stop at nothing to destroy civilization as we know it. The World Jewish Congress was created exactly for these times like this. So every Jew can fall asleep at night knowing they are safe in their own home. We are a voice for the Jewish people everywhere. We are the World Jewish Congress. News and some speculation from the mediated hostage for ceasefire talks underway in Doha. Israel has reportedly shown new flexibility and awaits the Hamas response. ILTV's Devo Klein has the latest. Israel reportedly offered a detailed document to Hamas setting out its position on all three phases of a deal for the release of all hostages and that Israel has shown new flexibility in several key areas. Channel 12 quotes unnamed sources saying Israel expects a response from Hamas leader Yechia Sinwar in the next three days and considers the prospects for a deal to be 50-50. Channel 12 reported that Israel prepared to free close to 800 Palestinian security prisoners for 40 Israeli hostages. Last month's Paris framework had provided for the release of 400 Palestinian security prisoners in exchange for 40 hostages. Israel is now ready to free almost double that number, Channel 12 reports, including 100 murderers. Also, for the first time in the negotiations, Israel is willing to discuss allowing Palestinians who evacuated to return to northern Gaza. There would be conditions for civilians returning to the north of the Strip. Israel continues to hold to red lines that rule out a complete IDF withdrawal from Gaza and insists that the campaign to destroy Hamas will resume once the deal is carried out. Media reports say the Israeli negotiating team, led by Mossad chief David Barnea, has the mandate it needs from the government to advance in the talks. 
Sources close to the talks reportedly say the government needs to make a decision on sending the IDF into Rafah. They say indecision over a major ground operation in the final Hamas stronghold is hurting the negotiation efforts. And joining us to discuss the hostage deal and help separate fact from wishful thinking is Dr. Gershon Baskin, a leading expert in Palestinian affairs. Gershon, good to see you again. Good to see you too, Steve. Gershon, Israel is reportedly showing flexibility on the numbers of Palestinian security prisoners for the release of about 40 hostages, 800 possibly, including 100 with blood on their hands. Is this likely to sway Sinwar? Hamas published its response to the Israeli offer today at 1217 on their Telegram, various Telegram pages. They wrote their first sentence, our priorities are stopping the aggression, bringing in aid, the return of the displaced, and a clear reconstruction plan, and not limited to the release of prisoners as promoted by the occupation by Israel. Um, Hamas has rejected the Israeli offer, and uh, one of the chief Israeli negotiators communicated to me that the problem seems to be that both Israel and Hamas have very different goals in these negotiations, and there lies the problem. Hamas wants an end to the war. Israel is not willing to agree to end the war, and that's the bottom line of the reason for not reaching an agreement at this point that would return uh, about 40 hostages in exchange for the release of prisoners. If you had asked me several months ago, I would have said to you that the most important thing to Hamas at that point was releasing prisoners. But today, the most important thing to Hamas is ending the war, getting humanitarian aid in, and allowing the displaced people to return to their homes. I wanted to ask you about the displaced people. Apparently, Israel's now willing to let at least some thousands per day uh, go back to their homes in northern Gaza. Is that issue really important to Hamas and why? It is very important to Hamas because there's 1.3 million people crowded into the 20% of the Gaza Strip between Khan Yunus and Rafa. It's an, it's an incomprehensible situation for the people living there. I've been talking to two families this morning who are living there in tents and it's really impossible. And Hamas does want people to be able to go back to what might be left at their homes. And they're also very concerned with a humanitarian aid getting in. And what they argue in what they published, if you want to take it at face value, is that they are not negotiating on behalf of Hamas, but they are negotiating on behalf of the Palestinian people. That's the way they present themselves, at least to the Palestinian people and to the Arab world. Um, this makes it very difficult for us to negotiate with them because, of course, Israel wants to eliminate Hamas and their ability to control Gaza, and Hamas wants to stay in, in control in Gaza. What would you say are the remaining stumbling blocks before a deal can actually be reached? I think we, we have such a huge uh, mistrust of each other that it is very difficult communicating any kind of bridging proposals. We're relying on mediators who are third parties who have their own interest in their own ways of communicating. And my uh, suggestion to both Hamas and to Israel is that we find a way of having a secret direct back channel where messages could be communicated directly, where talks could take place over a longer period of time, where we don't have to wait for hours and days to get responses. We can be more creative than think out of the box and figure out a way that we can uh, create some kind of small win win for each side. There's not going to be a win-lose here. Right now, we're in a lose-lose situation, and that's not good for anyone. So we need to really be much more creative and uh, think of how we can get our hostages back, how we can get a ceasefire, because I think everyone could use a ceasefire right now, but also not create a situation where Hamas is going to remain in power in Gaza. If there, was a, the if there were a back channel, I'm sure you would have already been involved in it, uh, Gershon. So there are unnamed sources, and we don't have much time, but there are unnamed sources that, that are saying that if there's going to be a deal to be made, then of course the Rafa operation has to be off the table, at least for now. Is that your view as well? Yeah, I think so. We're talking about a large-scale operation in Rafa that would be off the table. Israel did bomb about five different uh, places in Rafa city last night. So there is warfare taking place within Rafa, but it's not the large-scale ground incursion into the area. That would be postponed. Uh, Gershon, I'm sorry we're out of time, but we'll be back to you as soon as there are some, I hope, positive developments. And have a uh, happy Purim. I know you're a Jerusalemite. 
Thank you. U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris said that it would be a huge mistake for Israel to move into Rafah with any type of major military operation. Harris also did not rule out consequences if Israel moves without Washington's backing. More from ILTV's William Sharon. The public spat between Jerusalem and Washington over the issue of an Israeli operation in Rafah is getting wider. And now U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris has joined the fray. We have been clear in multiple conversations and in every way that any major military operation in Rafah would be a huge mistake. Let me tell you something. I have studied the maps. There's nowhere for those folks to go. And we're looking at about a million and a half people in Rafa who are there because they were told to go there, most of them. And so we've been very clear that um, it would be a mistake to move into Rafa with any type of military operation. The vice president was then asked this. Mistake, but would there be consequences if he does move forward? Well, we're going to take it one step at a time, but we've been very clear in terms of our perspective on whether or not that should happen. Are you ruling out that there would be consequences from the United States? I am ruling out nothing. Speaking to soldiers at a Purim event, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu reiterated the need to conduct a Rafa operation and alluded to the Purim story. Experience the power of truth with ILTV News. If you're looking for quality content and captivating visuals, join our news community and become an integral part of our team as we embark on a mission to unveil the real Israel, dismantling the web of lies and misinformation that surround reporting on Israel. By subscribing to ILTV News, you will not only have access to the latest updates, but you will also amplify our message, creating a ripple effect that carries the truth far and wide. Subscribe today and help reshape the narrative. Available on the web, Android, and Apple. And Prime Minister Netanyahu has warned his Likud party that without the passage of his IDF draft bill, his coalition government will fall. The draft bill, should it pass, would extend the exemption from IDF conscription for ultra-Orthodox Jews. Netanyahu announced to his party that he would not renege on passing the ultra-Orthodox draft bill and that without the bill, the government could not remain in place. Netanyahu's announcement came after War Cabinet Minister and United Unity Chair Benny Gantz warned that he would leave the government should the bill be passed, and reports of several Likud ministers opposed to the bill. Gan said the nation demanded that there be more equal sharing of the burden. The subject of drafting the ultra-Orthodox into the army has been a point of deep contention in the public, including protests in the streets on both sides of the issue. Ahead of his trip to Washington, Defense Minister Gallant from Likud announced that he would not support the government bill. And joining us now is Times of Israel political reporter Sam Sokol. Sam, it's sounding serious. One does not often hear Netanyahu in a kind of a panic mode. He says the bill needs to pass or the government will fall. Is he right? And does he have the votes to pass it? So the ultra-Orthodox parties have come out very hard against this bill. And Netanyahu, for a very long time, has been dependent on these parties for his ability to create a coalition. The United Torah Judaism Party has said that the drafting of people who are learning full-time in yeshiva will be uh, too much for them, and that could lead to their exit from the coalition. At the same time, he's seeing pressure from both within his only crew party and uh, 
members of the coalition, so, so, uh, such as Benny Gantz, who have explicitly said, was explicitly said, you know, I'm going to leave if this passes. Now, the problem is that Netanyahu has been able to sort of kick the can down the road for years, getting uh, extension after extension from the High Court of Justice, which previously ruled that the current situation is unconstitutional, but they've allowed him uh, chance after chance to bring legislation to uh, to sort of fix the uh, fix the issue. Now, we're coming up against a hard deadline on this, and Netanyahu really doesn't have much maneuver in it anymore. Uh, a draft piece of legislation that he's going to present for approval in the cabinet tomorrow uh, was withdrawn after the attorney general said that she would be unable to legally defend it. It was legally indefensible. And Netanyahu has just now, uh, this afternoon, presented a revised version of the legislation, which what comes closer to uh, much closer to what critics of the ultra orthodox uh, exemption have been calling for. But it remains to be seen how it will be accepted within the cabinet. Well, well, uh, so far, we've seen guns coming out Sam, against it. I, I don't hear Netanyahu actually arguing that it's a good bill that would share the burden in society. Is, is it all about coalition politics? We need the soldiers. We need I more soldiers. That, I think uh, it is about coalition politics. Netanyahu has been, the last decade, beholden to the ultra-Orthodox parties to stay in power. Uh, without uh, shots in related to Judaism, he really is in a very bad state politically. And uh, he's doing what he can to try to please both sides. He knows that the status quo can't remain, but he also has much less maneuvering room than, uh, than he would wish. Netanyahu has stated in the past that he understands that the draft of the ultra-Orthodox is important, uh, but he seems to be placing a higher priority on his political survival. But uh, Sam, Netanyahu is the master politician in Israel. It seems like he's in a trap. His ultra-Orthodox coalition partners on one side, Gantz, and members of the Likud on the other. What's his way out here? Well, he's trying to reconcile two irreconcilable uh, positions, and that's uh, really a problem for him. As I said, he's starting to really run out of maneuvering room. The new draft that he's pushing forward uh, as I said, comes closer. It uh, pushes to have annual targets, to have uh, financial sanctions for yeshivas that fail to meet that uh, target, and it calls for the establishment of uh, new service tracks for the ultra orthodox. Uh, as I said, we'll see if it's uh, if it's enough to satisfy both the court and his non ultra orthodox political allies. But that remains to be seen. Sam, before we run out of time, I just want to ask you this. If the bill does not pass, does it mean new elections, or could some kind of a new coalition emerge without the ultra-Orthodox? That remains to be seen. The truth of the matter is that uh, the one thing that we can say with certainty about Israeli politics is that it's impossible to predict. Nothing is certain in Israeli politics. Sam, uh, have a remaining holiday, a happy holiday, Purim, in Jerusalem, and uh, regards to the, my friends in the Merechet of Times of Israel. Thank you very much. It's Purim today in Jerusalem and other walled cities in Israel. ILTV's Ariel Lachiani was in the nation's capital and met some of the folks out celebrating. Steve, so I'm here now at the United Purim Parade in Jerusalem. A thousand people have gathered here today to celebrate Purim, one of the happiest days in the Jewish calendar. And that's definitely reflected in the atmosphere around me. As you can see, hundreds of people are dressed in costume, kids are off school, there's music, there's dancing. It's a very joyous day. So we're going to speak to a few people and hear a little bit about their Purim plans. Tell me a little bit about what you're doing here today. Um, I'm here to see the parade and get dressed up. Yeah, we're pretty much just having fun together, dressing up. We did a little bit of a chesed today, um, having a happy poem. I always come to Yushalaya for Shushan Purim. It's the holiest day of the year. We're here to celebrate with Am Yisrael, with all the Jews, and have a great time. We're here to just have a good time, you know, show off some Purim uh, spirit. And, and the costumes. Come on, look at these dogs. Look at these dogs. What's your favorite thing about Purim? Many people who are uh, celebrating. It's a very good uh, vibe. Come to Jerusalem. 
it's not really a tradition, but it's just like hanging out with everyone. Really like, this is my first year in Israel, and it's m much of an experience in America. You're just like with like your family, like your little community. Here with like a whole country, just having a great time with everyone. Having like, really it's just the brotherhood that you really get on, on bottom. My favorite thing is this. They're happy and the environment and they fun, the music. Same, I love the people, I love the happiness, the party, all of this. Israel is the best country of the world. In Purim, it's very nice to see everybody celebrate um, because the the war and we did a chesed event um our media shot took us to uh, a rehabilitation center and we danced with people with special needs and had a little bit of a perm party which uh really brought us into the perm spirit And staying with Purim celebrations in the capital due to the war, most public celebrations were put on hold this year, but not so in Jerusalem. This year, and for the first time in over 40 years, the city decided to hold a Purim parade. ILTV's Rachel Safdie is at the parade. Rachel, what can you tell us about it? Hi, Steve. Well, yes, I'm standing here in Jerusalem as we're having the first Purim parade in 42 years. Uh, as you've said, these festivities are usually seen in cities like Cholon and Tel Aviv, which were canceled this year due to the war. And yet Jerusalem is holding the first parade in 42 years. Now, there were some changes and there was a lot of uh, conversation regarding if this parade should even happen as we are having a war and we still have 134 hostages in the Gaza Strip right now. And so the mayor of Jerusalem actually met with representatives of the hostage families on Thursday, a few days prior to the parade, and they made some changes so that the parade wouldn't be just a generalized, a, a Purim parade celebrating the Jewish holiday as usual, uh, but would also commemorate the, the families of the, the hostages, the families that have lost people uh, in this war. Uh, and we do see those changes. Now, there are still protests. There is a protest in the Mamilla Mall, relatively close to where the parade uh, is happening, saying it is still October 7th, and people are still against the fact that Jerusalem is having uh, a parade. And yet we do see uh, different sorts of aspects of the parade celebrating um, the fact that there are soldiers fighting in this war and that there are still hostages, remembering that there are still hostages there. And it, as you said, Rachel, we are in a war and there are people who are still against the parade. So how is the overall experience? Yes, so it's definitely a unique experience, a different experience from any Purim parade uh, we've ever seen in Israel, especially since it's the first time in so, so long that it's happening in Jerusalem. Uh, what's interesting to note is, is that while we still see people celebrating and a lot of kids in, in costume and having fun, we still have a lot of aspects of this parade that do remind us of the war uh, and, and talk about the hostages that are still there. So we had a man who was a reservist who fought in Gaza and actually lost both of his hands and he came here to speak in the parade. Uh, we also see a lot of the cars that are bringing in um, huge sculptures uh, and different attractions actually have the yellow band, the hostages band. We also saw the, the time clock reminding us that the hostages have been in Gaza for 171 days. So even so, we do see people uh, having fun, a lot of kids in costumes. We also see reservists and we also see people who, who remind us of the fact that we're still in a war. Sorry I had to work today and couldn't be there. Well, let's take a look at the weather forecast. Cloudy skies and light rain expected tonight around most of the country with temperatures reaching lows of around 12 degrees Celsius or 53 degrees Fahrenheit. And then tomorrow, partly cloudy skies and rising temperatures are set to reach highs of 22 degrees Celsius or 72 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, that's all the time we have for today's news. For more updates from Israel and all of your devices, check out our ILTV channels, subscribe to our ILTV newsletter, and don't forget to check out our new and improved website, ILTV.tv, with all the latest news from Israel. I'm Steve Liebowitz. Let's win the war and bring them home.